and not to paint the Bakshi. Uh, this uh, subsequent seminar was to have been chaired by Professor Rupendra Bakshi, but unfortunately he was taken ill this weekend, this last weekend, and he conveys his deep regrets at not being able to be with us this afternoon. I'm just trying to fill very big shoes, uh, standing in for him. I'm greatly honored to welcome to the Center for the Study of Foreign Governments one of the most distinguished scholars of law and society in our times, a leading theorist of the global south, Professor Boaventura de Souza Santos, Professor of Sociology at the University of Coimbra in Portugal, where he's also Director of the Center for Social Studies. This is in addition to his position of Distinguished Legal Scholar at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. As you all clearly know, Professor Santos has written and published extensively on issues of globalization, on the sociology of law and the state, on epistemology, on social movements, <coughs> and the world social forum. He's the author or editor of literally countless books. I tried counting them and I gave up. I don't have advanced mathematical skills. Um, in Portuguese, in Spanish, Italian, French, and English, and he's the recipient of awards and honors and doctoral degrees which are simply too numerous to mention. Um, in his classic work, which Professor Bakshi uh, communicated to me along with his regrets, is worth its weight in gold, he said. Um, uh, this is uh, the sort of most well-known of his, the most well-known and the first of his books in English that, uh, that I know of, Toward a New Common Sense, Law, Science, and Politics in the Paradigmatic Transition, Professor Santos explored three key concepts in modernity, law, power, and science. And he showed how modern science and modern law lost the balance that was originally uh, inscribed in the socio-political paradigm of modernity, the balance between social regulation and social emancipation. And in the context of what he later memorably characterized as the abyssal <coughs> quality of modern Western thinking, this paradigm applied only to the visible societies of the metropolis rather than to the colonial territories which fell literally on the other side of the abyss and thereby became non-existent and uh, invisible. Subsequently, in toward a new legal common sense, law, globalization, and emancipation, he argued the case for theoretically reconceptualizing the idea of legality based on locality, nationality, globality and reminded us that there is not one globalization, but many globalizations, and that the only way to emancipation is through globalization from below. <coughs> Alternative epistemologies are central to Professor Santos's exhortation to post-abyssal thinking, as he calls it, and uh, to what he terms radical presence. <coughs> One of his titles has it, another knowledge is possible. This is the idea that animates his current multidisciplinary, multi-continental, multi-country research project, Alice. Strange mirrors, unsuspected lessons, leading Europe to a new way of sharing the world experiences. This five-year project, financed by the European Research Council, seeks to rethink and renovate socio-scientific knowledge in light of the epistemologies of the South to develop new political paradigms of social transformation. <coughs> It is an attempt to address Europe's incapacity, which comes from, he argues, its intellectual exhaustion, to innovatively address the problems of justice in the present <coughs> by drawing upon the diversity of innovations that are taking place in the global south at the present. Um, related to his work on alternative knowledge, an important strand of Professor Santos's work has been on social movements in the global south, and I'm sure many here are familiar with his book, The Rise of the Global Left, The World Social Forum and Beyond. And I assume that this afternoon's lecture, which is provocatively titled, Is It Possible to Occupy the Law, promises to speak to that set of concerns. Professor Santos, we are very privileged by your presence today, since we are enjoined with you in your critique of mainstream models of law and society that animate Western scholarship. Your call to legal pluralism and to interlegality has a special resonance in this country. Um, legal scholarship here does not ignore and cannot ignore the complex relationship between law and social movements. 
these are some of the reasons why a few years ago this center initiated the establishment of the Law and Social Sciences Research Network, popularly and uh, cryptically and acronymically known as LASTNET, a virtual network of academics, activists, and lawyers who are engaged in law and social science research. And it remains our hope that this event will inaugurate <coughs> a sustained engagement with the LASTNET community. You're very welcome, all of you, Professor Santos. Thank you, Professor, for such a kind introduction. I hope I deserve it. I'm not sure. But I'm sure of some, one thing is that I would very much like to dedicate this talk to my dear friend, Pedro Pax. And uh, I wish him well, full, fast, complete recovery of such an intelligent, great mind that the pen is to all of us and has been inspiring for all of us for a long time. So, it is fair. Well, the, <coughs> the topic, in fact, I offered this, uh, uh, for this talk, three possible titles, and uh, the center decided that this would be the title that they would. There was one on social uh, legal theory of indignation revolts, of, uh, you know, there were several, three titles, uh, but probably this catches better than any other possible <coughs> title, what I'd like to discuss with you. Well, basically, uh, the topic of my uh, of my talk will be the following. I, I've been uh, working with, sharing, participating, and also studying, analyzing some of the revolts that started in 2011 in different countries. Uh, some of them in Southern Europe, uh, called the Indignados movement or the Indignation movement. Uh, but in fact, they started in 2011 in Tunisia, you know. And from there, a large movement erupted that was called the Arab Spring. So you have the Arab Spring, and then you have the movement of the Indignados, which takes place throughout Southern Europe, from Greece, Portugal, and Spain. Then you have the Occupy movement in the United States. Uh, then, basically at the same time of the Arab Spring, a little bit later, then you have the student movement in Chile, <coughs> 2012, that uh, brought the, the country to a standstill for a while. Very serious student movement of a country that had been the lab of neoliberalism uh, and dictatorship throughout the uh, 70s. And um, also the student movement, or young or youth movement, I would say, better, in Mexico, called One, Two, Three which was a movement to fight against corruption in the elections in Mexico. So, and um, we knew already movements in India, I'm not going to mention them because all of you know much more about uh, them than I do, but in a sense, if we put these different protests together, they are occurring at the same time almost. It looks like that we are facing a new form of globalization, bicontagion, it happens in one country, and next week apparent, apparently emerges, as we saw from Egypt, from uh, Tunisia to Chile, for instance, or from, uh, to Egypt, and then other countries, even Algeria and so on, attempted, but didn't succeed. So there are lots of movements, and some scholars have been talking about a revolutionary movement uh, or moment in the world, uh, comparing it to 19, 1848. Some, some, some people have compared it to 1848 which was also a kind of a globalization by contagion in Europe because some upheaval in one country spread without social networks, spread all over Europe in a couple of months uh, in 1848, uh, the revolutions of that period. And then, the, you know, others have ventured 1970, in, uh, uh, 1968, 1989, there are moments in which we can call them revolutionary moments. I'm not so sure if this is a, uh, an adequate uh, characterization of this period, but they point out to something that is quite new, uh, or probably uh, a different quality or a different quantity. It, it's, it's still too early to characterize it, but it looks like we are entering a period that I would characterize as uh, post-institutional. That is to say, the institutions that we have, they are still in place, democratic institutions, state institutions, 
but they seem not to be working as they should. And people really are not satisfied with that. And they probably they crave for new institutions who are still not there. There are some embryonic beginnings of these new institutions. So the old institutions are deteriorating, so to say, and the new institutions are still not there. So people resort to direct action. <coughs> they come to the streets. All these movements have in common the idea that they take uh, to the streets and to the plazas of the different cities around the world. And it looks like, uh, from their perspectives, the reason why they take the, straight, the streets and the plazas is because they are the only public spheres that have not been colonized by financial markets. It looks like the democracy has been captured, the institutions have been captured, the streets are still whenever they are, and they take to the streets. So, and this calls, in fact, for the, the moment in which we could say that also a kind of a, a low intensity civil war is going out in different parts of the world. And if you look at the news, sometimes it's from Thailand to Europe to Brazil to Mexico to many parts of South Africa, it's a good example, right? is that Mozambique. There is a low intensity civil war going on. We don't know sometimes it's high intensity, Syria, but in most countries it's low intensity. There are there's some violence, uh, but not, you know, uh, uh, to such a degree that uh, uh, brings it to the, the large corporate uh, uh, news of the world. But in fact, a dissatisfaction with the institutional framework that we have today. And that's why some of these movements call for a reform of the state, state reform, reform of the political system. And they are, in this sense, anti systemic. There is a kind of an exhaustion of the political forms of the modern state uh, in different parts of the world. Even if we discount for the fact that there is a you know, certain <coughs> problem of the state to many forms, very different forms in the colonial uh, world, and therefore uh, they cannot be brought into a kind of a single model. So these revolts are very different from the ones that started the, the millennium. In 2001, we started in Brazil the World Social Forum. And the World Social Forum was an attempt to show that there are not just one globalization, the neoliberal globalization, but the globalization from below, the globalization from social movements, social movements from Africa, from Latin America, from Asia, that meet and get together for two, four, five <coughs> days to share their struggles, share their uh, principles, their practices, their successes, their failures, their problems, their perplexities in their own country. And these movements, which continue today to entertain a conversation across different continents, for instance, Via Campesina today, peasants' organizations from more than 100 countries are together in Via Campesina. Or the, uh, the, 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 the Women's World March, Marcha Mundial de las Mujeres, in which we have feminist and women's movements from different continents that in fact started the World Social Forum, like the Via Campesina, and now are independent from that. The transcontinental indigenous movement, the ecological movement, the global justice movement. So these are movements that have some institutionality. They have leaders, they have activists, they have organizations, and uh, they have uh, spokespersons, and, and uh, they have principles and documents and so on. Nothing of this appears in the they are against leaders, they are against documents, they are against uh, uh, any kind of sustainable institutional action. Uh, in 2000, most of the movements would prefer institutional action. Go through the state, sometimes working outside the state, but also inside the state, like the landless movement in Brazil, occupying land and at the same time negotiating with the state. In and out. And that was the idea of these movements that we can in fact change the state from inside by putting pressure from outside. But these revolts in a sense have nothing of that. They, they, they really prefer direct action. And they are very volatile. They start sometimes being radical about what they reject. They're absolutely ignorant about what they want. They even don't, don't care much about what they want. 
They know, but they don't know. But they don't know very well what they do. That's radical negativity is the other side of the volatility of these movements. For instance, the Tunisian movement starts how? Self-immolation of a young person that wants to that the informal commerce on the streets, street vendors, be regulated in Tunis. And all of a sudden, you have a massive movement for constitutional transformation. And dictator <coughs> was forced to resign. In, Moza, in Brazil, in June, everything starts because the tickets of the public transportation and the small raise of 25 cents. It's a very small in Rio, in the currency of Brazil. It's a very small raise. And that's why revolt throughout the country that Surya was, uh, in one, two months, was calling for a constitutional assembly for a reform of the political system in Brazil. So it goes from small things to questioning the whole fabric of the society, particularly the institutional fabric of the society. And that's why it favors, in fact, direct action and not institutional action. Because there is no civil disobedience. It's political civil uh, disobedience. In civil disobedience, as you know, people respect the laws but they disobey out of their conscience. Here is political disobedience. They don't just trust those institutions anymore and the laws. So <laughs> it is important, I think, for the social scientists, for us, all of us, to analyze what is the impact of this on social theory, on political theory, and on legal theory, if any. That's, and in fact, we'll see how curious I became as I, I start working with some of these movements, like the Indignados movement, in, in Europe, or the Brazilian movement, and at the same time working with them and studying the, the movement in itself. The first idea that comes out, and so in the first part of my lecture I, I discuss a little bit the, 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 the description, broad description of this thing, a broad brush of these movements and the political meaning they have, and then what is the impact for legal theory, or social legal theory, uh, that is the, and that's the, the title of the So. The first thing that I think uh, has an impact on us is, is the idea of the moral or ethical register of this. That is the, the discourse the narrative as a moral term. It looks like neoliberal desertification of alternatives, political alternatives. This desertification of alternatives, political alternatives, leaves out only the possibility of a moral discourse. And this moral discourse is new because even for the World Social Forum and for the leftist movements, if you want, of some different kinds, some considered left, others not, this was not very typical. But more, much more political than ethical or moralistic, even less. So this is something that strikes us. The indignation, the name of indignation, that is not just in the southern Europe, is also in Greece, is also in Brazil. The indignation is a revolt, is rage against something, a state of affairs, that is considered to be very unjust. And in this case, in most cases, it's just the concentration of wealth that is really bringing these people out. And they take a lead that many people think that was invented uh, recently, the 1% against the 99%, and it can be read in 10 of August 1907, 1910, in Tolstoy's diary. That's where we have 1% and 99%. And it was taken by the movements, and today is part of the patrimony of the, the metaphors, of the narratives of, this, uh, of these movements. So, this is the first, uh, the first characteristic. Extreme inequality in our world is something that is hitting the people most at this point. Why? Even it's not a question of poverty, it's the question of scandalous inequality. You know, it's sometimes <coughs> in a country, one person has a, a, a bigger GDP than the country as itself, so to say. It's a kind of a concentrated wealth, like Carlos Slim in Mexico, for instance. The concentration of wealth is uh, very strong. 
Another thing that I think it's very interesting to analyze is the new kind of dictatorship that is emerging. I call it an impersonal dictatorship, which is created, is invisible almost. It is a global constitutionalism or neoliberalism imposing itself <coughs> upon the different national democracies and countries. So we have at national level many countries that consider themselves democratic countries, but above them there is a global constitutionalism of transnational corporations, of consultancy firms, of Asian rating agencies, of financial capital, of investment banks. The people that are hiring the best of our students after the first degree to be brainwashed in their think tanks or in global universities. So it's very invisible. It's not a dictator. It's very impersonal. Sometimes they even call the markets as if there is an invisible hand, even though we know it is very visible, because there are a few institutional investors that decide everything in the world. We know Goldman Sachs <coughs> is not invisible. It's quite visible. If you look at the prime ministers in Europe today, or the leader of the Central Bank, all of them ex CEOs of Goldman Sachs. So this idea of an impersonal dictatorship plus the concentration of wealth leads to the idea that we live in societies that are politically democratic but socially fascistic. In social terms, the concentration of power is putting more and more people at the mercy of the powerful. So the powerful has a kind of veto power over the lives of people. We see that now. We, don't have, we have seen that in the South, in the global South. We see that also now in Southern Europe. A rating agency decides <coughs> the well-being of the Portuguese or the Spanish or the Greek from one day to the next. Because the interest rates decide the destiny of public health and public education. So there are no sovereign decisions in this respect by the states. So that's a kind of an end of the sovereign state. So it looks like <coughs> democracy has been hollowed out. It has lost the battle with capitalism. It looks like today capitalism and democracy are in a battle. We can discuss that because it, this is particularly interesting to analyze that here or in Europe, particularly in Europe in which we had the idea of democratic capitalism, the idea that after the war, as you know, there was a model developed in Europe called the social democracy. And social democracy was based on the idea that if you heavily regulate capitalism, <coughs> nationalize key industries and assets of the country, regulate the financial capital, it will be possible to account for some measure, significant measure of social distribution that will force capitalism to coexist with democracy. And democracy prevails over capitalism. Well, we can see today that probably this is a, a lost battle to the extent that everywhere you go, we see the crisis of the European social model, the crisis of social democracy, the idea that states are spending too much in social policies, and in fact, also in social sciences. You see that everywhere, uh, except in some global South countries, but in most countries. So there is this idea that probably democracy, which was uh, in the beginning, uh, after the war, at least in Europe, was this idea that could be, bring about even socialism. Now I think that capitalism can bring, can bring about fascism, but democracy cannot bring about uh, socialism. On the contrary. Capitalism that prevails today is the most anti-social version of capitalism in global terms. So it is a serious. I think that the, I'm going to, to reflect what I hear and what I work with with these young people calling for real democracy. Why real democracy? Because this democracy has been captured by anti-democrats. It's not that anymore. We, in a sense, from their perspective, we live in a world of a permanent state of exception. And you, I can understand that in a certain part of Europe, we can see that. We can see that in many other countries. 
<coughs> then under normal conditions of the Constitution, because there is no state of emergency, it's normal. Everything is normal in constitutional terms. But in fact, salaries are being cut. Social rights are being cut. Public education is being privatized. Public health is being privatized. In many countries. It's not across the globe yet. But who knows? It may come. The reason why it's not coming throughout is because, in my view, we have now a new phase of colonial plundering of natural resources that is going around in many countries in Africa, in Latin America. The reason why we are having some kind of measure of social democracy in Latin America is because of plundering of natural resources in great part due to the development of China and the quest for natural resources of China. We can get into that later on. But this plea for real democracy is quite interesting. Because if you look at the movements at the beginning of the 20th century, for instance, when Gandhi arrived in Europe to study law, uh, you know that <coughs> Gandhi, in some of his texts, shows that of all the Western political traditions, probably anarchism would be the one that he would probably favor. Not the violent anarchists, but the peaceful anarchists. At the time, there were lots of violent uh, explosions and protests throughout Europe, in Paris, in, uh, in, in London, in, uh, in, uh, in Moscow, in, in New York. And of course, there was no possible quest for democracy at that time. 100 years later, democracy as an idea has caught the imagination of the people. So these young people, with any young and not so young people, they call for real democracy. Of course, implying that the democracy that we have now is not a real one. So, is this any meaning for us? Is there any impact for our social theories, for our political theories? There are the interesting things: is that <coughs> most of them they are very peaceful. They sometimes they have revolutionary languages, but they are peaceful. And whenever they are violent, is in self-defense against police brutality, against the criminalization of social protest in many countries. So there are some things that I think that are, are new, and, uh, and we should pay attention to that. So I'm trying to identify some of the main uh, 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 traces of these uh, new revolts as they are emerging. They, the fact that they are so volatile there are no leaders and not many documents, and sometimes they appear as fulgurations and then disappear. They come again. Some of them are seasonal because they're on the streets. And in the winter time in the northern country, it's very cold. So we cannot protest on the streets and plazas with one meter of snow. So it comes with spring and goes with the winter. And now we know that in Brazil, and, uh, <coughs> I can predict that, but it's not a prediction. It's based on the knowledge I have the movement, as the World Cup approaches, we are going to have a new wave of protests in Brazil. It's being prepared now to show that the government has spent too much money on that investment and no money on education and no money, <coughs> no real money on health and public transportation. That is to say, the public services people are looking for. So, probably they are not social movements. I call them collective presences. And we have to see that probably in our political theories, we have been missing something. Both on the Marxist side and on the liberal side, our political theories were based on the idea that only politically organized subjects can conduct social transformation. Maybe social movements, maybe parties, maybe associations, whatever. But most people are disorganized. They are depoliticized. And these people are not cared about. So they are not part of our political, theoretical imagination. Well, these movements, and I've interviewed lots of people, they have been in a protest for the first time in their lives. And some of them are in the 50s. <coughs> and some of them are even older than that. So they were depoliticized. Why were they depoliticized? Why? What does it mean? It means that the threshold of their political engagement had not reached through the forms and institutions that we have at the and that's why this is a kind of a lack of institutional density 
to include many people, many social groups that feel themselves excluded from that. And this is the challenge is that these disorganized, depoliticized crowds, so to say, are becoming social actors. And they call our attention, the attention of the, the politicians, but they are not an organized subject in the ways that we thought they would be. And they are very anti-systemic. Well, is this really a very important thing that's happened? Well, probably these moments came and went. And in fact, they have different distant destinies. Uh, some of them were anti-systemic, but then faded away. The Occupy disappeared. We know the perversities of the Adder of Spring, is that nobody can hide the fact that not uh, look at the Constitution in Tunisia is less the best example. <coughs> how long does it take to produce a new Constitution? And our country can get paralyzed already in the second or third government without a constitution. Even though that was after the radicalization of the process, the quest for a new constitutional assembly was the key element. And it is interesting that the, the plea for a constitutional assembly is present in many of these movements. It was present in Chile. Now the new president of Chile, the Socialist Party, is now, in fact, trying to avoid that demand from the people, a new constitution. The same in Brazil. The president of Brazil is trying to avoid a new constitution. But she was forced to say, yes, we are going to revise our constitution. That was the demand coming from, the, from these movements, from these collective presences. Why is that? Why are they so anti-systemic and at the same time call for a constitution, with, which is a very modern and institutional document? And many movements for a long time thought that constitutions was uh, just a piece of papers written by experts, that have nothing to do with the people in many countries. I have a friend that wrote six or seven constitutions for six or seven countries. There was no bottom-up movement to create a constitution. There were, of course, very good examples. India is a very good example. The constitution of 1988 in Brazil is another example. The constitution of Colombia in 1991 is a good example. The constitutions of Ecuador, a, uh, 2008 and Bolivia 2009 are good examples. But in a sense, they are exceptional. If you take the almost 200 countries that we have in the United Nations system. So I think that we have to understand that this diversity is <coughs> calling us to draw our attention to things that probably were being uh, uh, neglected by our theories. In order to advance a little bit, I, I think that. We have to understand also the differences among these movements, these processes, and these collective processes. And I think that I identify three genealogies in these, uh, these reports. The first one, uh, as the best example, is the Arab Spring. Um, they emerge out of the ruins of the national projects, national development projects, Arab nationalism. We had also one version of socialism <coughs> in 48. So these ruins of the national projects are creating these revolts with sometimes an anti-Western Islamic uh, element, but with democratic imagination. Many people would say, Islamic people never care about democracy. That was the cry on the streets in Cairo, and on Plaza, a real democracy there. <coughs> Probably not a liberal democracy of the West, something else. Probably intercultural democracy is a concept that probably we have to start working with. But this genealogy is different from the one of the Occupy. The Occupy is the self-ruin of neoliberalism. You know, I call it the self-ruin because, in a sense, in a perverse mirror, <coughs> the Occupy movement reflects neoliberalism. Neoliberalism is all today characterized by this uh, idea that there is no alternative. You know, financial capital, they have to rule the world, and nothing can be done. They cannot be regulated because they are the regulators. And there is no alternative to this economic model. Well, the occupied people refuse to make demands, to present alternatives, because they think 
Once we make a demand, it is co-opted. So we reject this system. They don't want to demand anything from the system, in a sense. That's the radical element. But at the same time, there is a kind of perverse resonance with neoliberalism that has taken away from the minds of people the idea that there is an alternative. They don't see the alternative either. So I think it's another different genealogy <coughs> from the Arab Spring, of course. And there is a third one, which is the indignados and uh, the Brazil or the Mexican or the Chilean uh, movements. In here, we have uh, the ruins of something that was similar or was social democracy or similar to social democracy. The idea <coughs> that we should have some social distribution within a capitalist democracy, a democratic society. And they believe in this idea. They are young democracies. Portugal has lived longer in dictatorship than in democracy. Brazil longer in dictatorship than in democracy. Chile, almost the same. Chile is different. Chile, in fact, was a, 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 a small period. But these young democracies have still some strength. So people believe that it is possible to claim for a new constitutional assembly, political rights of education, public education, public transportation, and public health. These are the three big demands of the revolts in, uh, in the Indignados movement and in Brazil and Chile. That is to say, here we still appeal to the model of social democracy to be reinvigorating the hollowed out democracy that they have now. And they were aspiring uh, something better. And this has been surprising for many people because, after all, Brazil had gone through some real social redistribution since President Lula arrived in power. Why are the people revolting? If in fact now they have three meals a day. Many people in the past didn't have three meals a day in Brazil. You remember the promise of President Lula. I'm not going to do any kind of revolution. I'm just <coughs> going to try that all Brazilians have three meals a day. That's my revolution. And he has delivered to a certain extent. He has delivered that. The problem is that once you include people in the social conflict, they raise their own expectations and they start demanding on the system the fact that they don't, it's not enough to have three bills at that. It is important to have public education of quality, public transportation of equality, public health of equality. <coughs> and there the system is not delivering that and is delivering lots of stadiums for football, for soccer, World Cups. And people see that the priorities of the government don't go with the priorities of the people, and that's why they probably revolt. So these three uh, genealogies are <coughs> all of them trying to show that our world is probably a world that the challenges that we are confronting are from a different kind from the previous one. That they are, there are continuities, but also the challenges. For instance, as I mentioned already, the concentration of wealth does not go together with a very visible concentration of power. Power is concentrated in financial markets, but it's invisible. It's anonymous. We don't know who the dictators are. We cannot name them. There are studies that now know that 47 transnational corporations control two-thirds of the world trade. <coughs> but nobody bothers to identify them as dictators. So there is a kind of a fragmentation of power that goes together with concentration of power. And that's why resistance is also so fragmented. Resistance is uh, more chaotic and very much fragmented. Because the concentration of power is allowing power to do things that they did before. The rules of the war have changed completely. Look at the drones. <coughs> Look at the drones as a metaphor of the concentration of power. A drone is an instrument with so much power that can attack a target without any consequences, without any risks. Drones is a non-declared war in which there are no heroes, only victims. And they are not military victims. Civilians. 
take that as a metaphor. It looks like we are witnessing a dronification of politics. What is the difference between a drone and the decision of a rating agency that ruins a country from one day to the next? Or a FMI, a FM, a IMF structural <coughs> I saw the industry of cashewnuts industry in Mozambique destroyed from one day to the next by the World Bank. It's just a bad. No more credits for the cashewnuts in Mozambique. And all the industry collapsed. Many years later, I found hundreds of workers on strike on the doors of these companies in the north part of Mozambique. And gosh, years later, so, this dronification of politics that allows for power to attack in such a way that is very difficult to defend <coughs> from power attacks. It's something that is getting into the minds of the people as they resist, but they resist within a model of thinking that is being recolonized. I think our minds are being by this idea that there is no alternative, by the idea that what is important is what the markets say. There is this idea that democracy is dangerous. Look at the subtlety, or not so subtlety, of the corporate news about India, Brazil, and so on. These countries, two years ago, were the BRICS, you know the BRICS, the emerging countries. Today they are the fragile five. Who are the fragile five? Brazil, India, South Africa, Indonesia, Turkey. All of them democracies. Who are not fragile? Russia and China. Can you see the connection? Democracy brings fragility. And everything passes without people noticing what's going on. Because we have another paradox very clear in our time. We never had so much free communication and information, and not so much surveillance. So this is the paradox of free communication and surveillance. <coughs> we know that our lives are surveilled. Whatever I'm saying here, probably, if there is a, a federal budget, and now there's a federal budget in the US, they probably are taping this as well. So this sense of freedom, together with surveillance, is very difficult for us to to probably figure out uh, in a sense that maybe um, maybe uh, conducive to alternatives. And finally, there is a strange thing also in this <coughs> characterization that's very intense and fluid. Global mobilization of people, of ideas, of movies, of capital goes together with the rise of a global apartheid. The global elite is leaving today more and more away of the poor, away of the pollution. They are even building new islands so that they can live exquisitely outside any burdens from society. So it's new forms of apartheid. And that's, this is another form of what I call social fascism. So political democracy together with social fascism is very difficult. Our political theory tells us that we are either democratic or fascistic. We may be both at our time at different levels. So, what is the impact of this for social legal theory? That's the second and last point of my talk. Well, if you look at the political imagination of these radical rejections and these revolts, it looks like they are not interested in law at all. They privilege direct action. Law in the, the framework, in the construction of the modern state, law is the, the, the really the icon, the nucleus of law and order, of institutionality. And these <coughs> movements are extra or post-institutional. They couldn't care less about law. And if they care about rights, at least some of them care about rights. So I started this project, with, uh, which is part of my Alice project, larger project, 
with a kind of an hypothetical reconstruction. If these people would think about law, what kind of conception of law would that be? <coughs> and that was a challenge for me. The challenge, and my specific interest in this, is that all these revolts seem to contradict whatever I've been writing over the last 25 years about law and society. Some of you know my work on, uh, not only on legal pluralism, but uh, the idea is the last chapter in Gordon New Legal Commons says, the title of the chapter is, Can Law Be Emancipatory? Can Law Be Emancipatory? And basically, what I claim there, based on my work and my experience, <coughs> is that sometimes it is possible to develop a counter hegemonic use of law. Law, of course, reproduces power and power relations and inequalities of power relations, but these power relations are contradictory. And uh, the oppressed, the marginalized, the discriminated against the groups, the workers, the women, the indigenous, the peasants, the lower castes, they can use law to advance their causes. Judicial system sometimes, the legislative sometimes. Because this, the state and law is itself a social relation. It's a contested terrain. It's a contested domain. And therefore, you can fight in the contradictions. And in fact, my work has been telling me that. For instance, I've been working, and uh, the paper is available in English, with the, the landless movement in Brazil. And the landless movement, they are a very Marxist-oriented movement, in the beginning would say, law and legal system is bourgeois. Stay away from that. We have to do our political mobilization, and nothing else. But then they started to be criminalized by the legal system, by the judicial system, by the police. And they start to fight in courts. And all of a sudden, they went from defense, defend themselves in criminal courts, to advance their causes in the civil courts, to legalize occupations. Because according to the Brazilian constitution, the, law that, the land that remains unproductive for a couple of years can be object of expropriation for land reform. So they started <coughs> using this clause to advance their causes in courts. And they got some significant in the judiciary. So, working this, and in fact very inspired by the neo zapatist uh, conception of the subaltern cosmopolitanism, I've been trying to develop the possibilities of counter hegemonic use of law. And I have uh, some examples in my, in my work, uh, others that work with me. Now, uh, a larger group, for instance, right to health, or the right to health, or in India, now it's also a topic, in South Africa with the pandemics of HIV, how they manage, in fact, to overturn the patterns of the retroviral products so that the, the, the medicines would be available to people. It was fought in court, in the Constitutional Court of South Africa. So the court said, you know, well, my dear friend of Pedro Marx, he has analyzed this better than anyone else that I know. Uh, it is also a mixed reading, he says. There are the discontents of the constitutionalism, of course. But there is ambiguous because it's a struggle, it's contradictory. Sometimes we advance, sometimes we progress. Well, I realize the Supreme Court in Brazil is the same thing. We have granted uh, the, the, the territories of indigenous peoples, for instance, huge tracts of land, much bigger than Portugal. Portugal is very small, but you know, bigger than France for an indigenous tribe in Latin America. At the same time, they have criminalized protests. They are sanctioning the massacre of indigenous leaders, of landless leaders that are being killed every day in Brazil because they resist against the mega projects in mining or in the big monoculture plantation. It is now the agro-industrial development <coughs> pushed by, in fact, China, most of it is exported, soybeans exported to China. And I have entered the territories of indigenous people. And we know here <coughs> land and land displacement. We are going to have a, a, a session of our popular university of the social movements in Mumbai uh, on the 14th and 15th. And we are coming together some 30 movements uh, throughout, from, throughout India in that fight against land, <coughs> uh, you know, land grabbing and the displacement of the uh, peasant's population. So these ideas 
uh, have been put forward under the following condition. I have always claimed that the, the counter-hegemonic use of law is only possible if you politicize <coughs> an issue before legalizing it. That is to say, political mobilization has to go together with judicial or legal mobilization. If you do, don't do that politically, you never succeed. In it. At least that was my experience. And I learned that uh, from a liberation theologian bishop during the dictatorship in Brazil, Dom Helder Cabra. They had to order, help to organize the slum dwellers politically and then bring their case to the court when it was already a political issue. And then the courts were a little bit intimidated by the, by the movement. So you politicize an issue and then you bring it to court. Well, you can see it in different uh, situations that it has been possible. Well, is this fantasy? <coughs> if you look at the discourse and narratives of the revolts, this is more or less liberal fantasy. Because in the end, the oppressors always win. And therefore, we should discard all these victories because they are meaningless. It looks like if you look at the, the discourses. So I'm going to, uh, I'm forced by the movements, and I think it's also a, a challenge for all of you. The social innovation and political innovation in movements forces us to <coughs> advance our theories, to change our theories, to uh, modify them. I think that in order to understand what's going on, I have to distinguish three moments, Hegelian moments, of three dimensions of law, or three conceptions of law. One is what I call the configurative law, the law that, that reflects and reproduces the unequal power relations at a given point in time. Configurative law. Then there is the reconfigurative law, which is law as it is resort to to change the unequal power relations. Reconfiguring power relations. So this is very important. And there is a third dimension, is prefigurative law. Law that in a certain moment of struggle prefigures the future, anticipates an alternative society. It's almost a performative law, prefigurative law. So let's see how we can see these different dimensions in the a revolt. And if you do a kind of an archaeological inquiry into these movements, you can see the following. And that's my reading uh, out of this hypothetical reconstruction. Configurative law. Yeah, these movements couldn't care less about legal pluralism something that all of us have been very much, you know, the people in sociology very much involved in the presence of legal pluralism. They focus on official state law. And law is official state law, period. They are very urban, they have no experience of rural, uh, most of these movements, no hope on other uh, cosmovisions or legal cosmovisions. And what they start from is from the idea that law has been occupied by the powerful. And then, <coughs> There is, and I reproduce here, there is the abyssal line. There is an abyssal duality in our legal systems. Our unified, autonomous, universal legal system is in fact dual. There is the law of the 1% and the law of the 99%. This duality is so radical that it is invisible. Because our law schools, our training, they only see the unified legal system. But the duality is there and is a prison. The law of the 1% in Weberian terms is a personal law. It's what Weber called the status law. It's a personal law that goes with powerful wherever he goes or she goes. The 99% law is the law of the oppressed, the law of the powerless. That one is the territorial law of Weber. But that does not include the 1%. The one percent are excluded from that. So this is a reconstruction, a mental reconstruction. And therefore, these two systems are incommensurate. They don't know each other, they don't encounter each other, and you can only see them or trace this duality through consequences that have to be analyzed in terms other than the ones that we have used in sociology of law. For us, 
very beautiful <coughs> sociology of law, even in our critical tradition, we have always believed that the discrepancy between law in action and law in books is a deviation. For these revolts, it is constitutive. Because it is this constitutive nature of this discrepancy that allows for the move for the law appear credibly as unified, even though it is abyssally divided. Two types of legality in the same. You see? So, it is a different way of looking, of course, at law. And why is that? <coughs> well, because together with this uh, abyssal invisibility, so to say, there is a normalcy, a normalcy bias. The idea that we underestimate the extreme emergency that is upon us, the extreme inequality, the extreme events that are destroying the normal lives of lots of people around the world. They have lived in ancestral territories. All of a sudden, they see the tractors coming in, they see the people destroying them with a new mining project. From one day to the next, where are the sacred territories? Where are they the sacred, sacred cemeteries? We have in Mozambique people that have been displaced already three times from, from their land in uh, a three-year period. So these southern examples, people try to deny in our theory it's difficult to <coughs> really evaluate how these southern events destroy normalcy. Because everything otherwise is normal. The news are normal. The radio is normal, the television is normal, the constitution is normal, the newspaper every day is normal. Religion is normal. So this abnormality is not figured out completely because of this normalcy <coughs> bias. And that's why you don't see that probably sovereign projects in any country are gone. States are not sovereign anymore. What are sovereign to a certain extent that in certain cases is very minimal. Or it happens in one period, but then collapses in the next period. It is much more fluid than we could imagine before. So this abyssal divide, how can we identify it? Probably we have two strategies. One for those that have been working in post-colonial studies. And I'm sure for you here in India, I think I feel very at home to do this is that this abyssal divide has some elective affinities to the unified laws of the imperial powers, the laws from the metropolitan society and the laws of the colony. That is to say, there were always in this legal modernity two fields that didn't know each other. The metropolitan field, legal field, and the colonial legal field. Sometimes the same lawyers, sometimes the same judges, working in both, but in commerce. <coughs> what happens that now is that this metropolitan and colonial imagination works inside the geopolitical space. That's what we could call internal colonialism. In fact, it's a concept developed by a colleague from Mexico, Pablo Gonzalez Casano. So these forms of internal colonialism are really making it invisible for the theories that in fact these different worlds and this abyssal divide exists and then same time is negated. So what is the main symptom of this duality is that there is no single illegality in our society. There are two types of illegalities. The illegalities of the powerful and the illegalities of the powerless. Again, this is the construction of this, uh, of what we can see. The illegality of the powerful is dealt with in a very mild way through three mechanisms. Impunity, sometimes immunity, and sometimes illegitimate legal change when the current laws are not sufficient. They change the laws. Because it's a personal law can change the law. You see? While the illegality of the powerless is dealt with with extreme harshness. Look at what happens today throughout Latin America to indigenous leaders. They are being incriminated by anti-terrorist laws. They are terrorists. Why are they terrorists? They block roads and do block roads. And they block roads so that the, the timber companies or the mining companies don't enter their territories. But blocking a road today 
according to the directive that came from the Security Council, you know, those anti terrorist laws that are passed all over the world, is now a form of terrorism. So this criminalization of so protest, because these laws, look at them closely. I mean, the right, the defense rights, the rights of defense and the lawyers are very, very strict combined, you know, compared with the, the regular criminal law. They are almost exceptional law. And they are very harshly dealt with. Even in the countries that have been doing very solid innovations, some of leaders, some of my dear friends, the leader of the indigenous movement in Ecuador, is now being incriminated as a terrorist. Why? Because they protested outside the building where the government was signing the concession of the oil companies uh, in the Amazonian region. So extreme harshness. For the illegality, because they have not asked for permission to be in the public space there. So there is a kind of an ordinance that you really didn't comply with. But you are accused of terrorism. So this excess of illegality shows that, in fact, there are two suitable standards, because they are two different legal systems. The legal system of 1% and the legal system of 99%. And then there is a second characteristic that's even more troubling, intellectually and politically, is there are areas of domination today that are beyond the distinction between illegal and illegal. A third gray zone is emerging that I call a legal. Guantanamo is beyond legal or illegal. The way they destroy the body of Osama bin Laden is beyond legal and illegal. It's something new. You kill a guy and you make a guy disappear. I'm on my London, Geneva, Geneva Conventions. So there are things that are beyond the legal and illegal. Secret laws. Do you know that in the United States there are lots of secret laws? Laws that the lawyers that are defending the accused cannot know because they are secret. And there is a huge debate about these laws. But they are not being challenged by the Supreme Court in the United States because of security reasons. During the dictatorship in Brazil, there was a famous law on national security about the territorial defense of Brazil that says the law number so and not so is the national security law. This law is secret, period. That's the only thing that was published in the national uh, journal. The official paper where the laws are passed it was a secret law. But that was dictatorship. Today, these things are done under democratic <coughs> regimes. And that's why it's a new form of democracy dictatorship. <coughs> is divided, I think, is very troubling, and therefore, is a uh, uh, nice. final point is that for, for those that know my work, I have uh, always distinguished between the th three structural elements in law, from a sociological perspective. Law, modern law is, is based on these three structural elements that then they can act in different ways. Rhetoric, argumentation, violence, and bureaucracy. In fact, in the modern state, violence has to be together with bureaucracy and bureaucracy with violence. But there is also argumentation in the public sphere, the argumentation, the political argument, political discussion. There are laws that are more, for instance, in our studies of legal pluralism, one could say that uh, the traditional law very often had more readily no bureaucracy and some violence. But we can make these correlations among the different structural elements of law. Well, we can say that probably the law of the 1% of the is just rhetoric. There's not much bureaucracy there, there's not much violence that's not present there. While the law of the 99% is basically bureaucracy and violence. And in exceptional cases, violence without bureaucracy. So I think that this allows us to see the differences that uh, in our kaleidoscope of realities, we have to expand our lenses so that we see that part of what we see from the canonic theories that we have inherited are really creating a space of absence, 
of invisibility. That was what I call the epistemology of blindness. We see something, we get blind to see. And I'm not even sure whether I'm not being blind, blind vis-a-vis -vis certain realities that I'm not envisaging now. So we should be aware, and that's what I, uh, after all, is the gist of the epistemology of the sound, is this idea that, in fact, our knowledges are always have to be plural, but never complete. There is impossibility of this uh, uh, knowledge that probably we should go back to the idea of Nicolaus of Cusas in the 14th century. At the most, we can be learned ignorant. This, that is to say, people that know the limits very well of the, our, our knowledges in order to advance uh, our theories. So, this idea of this illegality, so for this principle of the revolts, it is very clear there is only equality before the law on the disputes in the disputes among the powerful. Then there is real equality before the law. But if you, across classes, class, across <coughs> difference of religions and so on, you don't have equality, of course, because they are two different systems that don't communicate. So, and we have seen that. I mean, we could see that this illegality emerges under a very simple way. Look at what happened to the crisis 2008, the financial crisis. The bailout of the banks, sacrificing the 99% in order to exempt from sacrifice the 1%. The banks. You bail out because <coughs> you don't bail out families throughout the world today. So I think that this uh, analysis that I put forward is uh, what I think is coming out of, uh, of these movements. And they, they know, I think, that at the level of international law, that probably the, the realm of illegality is what I call the new primitive accumulation, the plundering of natural resources. And here is very interesting, because it's the imperial element has to be much more sophisticated than before. Because now we have sub-imperial powers. India, in fact, in Mozambique, is a, a sub-imperial power. South Africa is a sub-imperial power in Africa. Brazil is a sub-imperial power in Latin America. It's enough to talk to people in these countries. And sometimes the companies of these countries behave exactly the same way as the transnational corporations of the global north. So there is a global south that is an imperial south that reproduces the global north. But there is an anti-imperial south, which are the social movements, <coughs> that are the struggles in which you can see all these innovations also emerging throughout. So I think that, uh, in conclusion, configurative law is very central to these movements. Reconfigurative law seems not to be present, but there is a prefigurative law. What is the prefigurative law? It's the law of the occupation. Whenever the occupation takes more than one or two days in a movement, in a plaza, for instance, uh, legal ordering <coughs> of the place starts emerging. There are rules. There are assembly-based type of participation, deliberation, and rulemaking. And people sometimes are expelled from the occupation by not obeying those rules. For instance, using hard drugs during the occupation. You can be expelled from the community. Look at the interesting, uh, for those that are interested in legal pluralism, in the indigenous laws in many countries, expulsion is the harshest punishment that you can get. Because a person outside its community, or his or her community, is nothing. Because the person coexists with his community, or her community. So it's the harshest, it's not the bad sentence. So, prefigurative law exists there, but it's, only, it's a kind of an anticipation of a different society. A better society, so to say. But it's not my revenge. But I think that there is still some space for reconfigurative law in these movements. And that's why in the end, I, I think they don't contradict so much my theory. They contradict to a certain extent, but I see two points in which you can come together. The first one is the following, is that the political conditions for the counter-hegemonic use of law are getting more and more difficult in the world. It used to be easier than it is now, across the globe. There are, of course, microclimates in different countries. But in general, it's becoming more difficult to mobilize politically in order to have a judicial <coughs> in many countries. I can
intensive help in the countries where I've been working, and, and uh, probably others. The, the second uh, point of convergence is, after all, these movements that don't believe in law at all, they make a plea for a constitutional assembly. That is to say, they believe in a change in the political system, and that's why they need a constitutional assembly. A very modern instrument, a new assembly, and all these processes, together with indigenous movements of the 90s, the constitutional claim has always been there. So it looks like we are at a moment in which the old institutions have to be replaced by new institutions that are still out there. And that's why the claim of the constitutional assembly is coming so often. People, they don't know actually how to do it. Because the, the framework of the modern state, this monolithic structure, is so strong upon us and has colonized so much our minds that it's almost impossible to think outside this box. But at least there is this uneasiness with this model and a plea for something different. I think that's here that I see some conjunction and probably uh, this is not a revolution. That is the idea that probably democracy cannot be, being, be brought about by revolution. When in the past we got you really counted was democracy and revolution, it looks like now that we need a revolutionary movement to bring about democracy again. And that's why probably the idea of the Constitutional Assembly, which was very much present in the American Revolution and the French Revolution, is probably present in this movement. Thank you. Wandered over space and time and so skillfully led up to your theoretical construction. We've been grappling with many of these issues in this in our own context, uh, as you probably know. Uh, but let me not say anything more at this point and just invite questions uh, or comments. Yes, please. Would you like to introduce yourself? No, uh, yes. Uh, my name is Vic Kanwar. I uh, teach law. No, I'm sorry. Is this working? Uh, I teach law at a school about Part of Delhi. Uh, I was just wondering if uh, there was uh, there's there's kind of a silence in this presentation about certain kinds of performances of protest that don't take to the streets, for example, uh, and don't uh, uh, work with more of a what we think of as an emancipatory project uh, against inequality and so on. If there are those, uh, for example, there's an anti-corruption type movement. There's a municipal government in Delhi uh, that takes this issue uh, to different kinds of fora, such as protests and. Uh, can, can I skip this? Please. Um, and uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, maybe mob violence. Um, and then in the in the United States, there is a right-wing populism uh, that stages itself in a shutdown of the government, for example. Uh, using a kind of constitutional rhetoric of the Constitution and exile and so on, but again, not taking to the streets and not aligning itself with kind of Occupy in that kind of uh, way, but basically uh, also having a very anti-institutional type of critique. And so I wonder if these silences were uh, because of their political valences or their uh, ambiguities in that sense, or if they just simply don't uh, belong to the same epistemology of street violence and or street violence, street action, and crowds, and so on, that, that we're talking about here. Put together the question. Yes, Nila. Yes, Nila. Thank you. That was a grand sweep of recent history. Uh, you know, Manuel Castells, um, in I think in the 80s, in the city and the government, made a very, very important point about urban protests. And I was a little um, puzzled by your reference to movements, because not all of them are movements. Some of them are spontaneous protests, they die out and reappear and die out. And then when they reappear, some of them have joined the military, as in the case of Egypt, and others have become opposition. And then they create what a constitution, which says God, you know, the source of the constitution is the Sharia. That's happening in Egypt. So one can't really um, identify what this movement, these, these spontaneous popular protests are about, except as, um, 
as, as, as a discontent against the existing system. A lot of the social forum you spoke of are networks and campaigns. Many of them don't even involve popular mobilization. They are networks among very well-funded NGOs and they put forth agendas which no one knows where, where it comes from. And a lot of struggles in, in uh, what is protests in Southern Europe seem to me about, seem to be about consumption. So it brings me back to Castell that urban protests are more about consumption than about production relations. And if that is so, how radical can the entire agenda be? Because these protests, these networks, and these networks are probably a little more politically dangerous than popular protests. You don't even know where those agendas are coming <coughs> from. <coughs> and these campaigns um, are, are, can go either way. They can lapse back into uh, you know, the Sharia is the source of the law, and, and the entire nationalist secularist project is set, is, is set back. Uh, what I want to really pose to you is how ruptural a moment can be, because this has happened before. It happened in 1989. Many classes have always come onto the streets when they have been denied political and civil liberties. It happened during the Velvet Revolution. It happened in Brazil during, against the military in 1985. So civil society mobilization peaks against recalcitrant states. But the moment the state falls or is taken over, all these movements just dissipate. So it, it, I really want to see what political possibility you see in these disparate movements, which really, and I, as far as I know, they're all asking for social policy. Hardly anybody is asking for, any of the movements are asking for a restructuring of social relations, and they leave power structures intact. What they temper with is with the symptoms. I don't know, I would have. I, I, Maybe I'm more skeptical or more cynical, but I, because I have studied global civil society, but I don't see much possibility of a ruptural moment occurring with these protests. Um, yes. I mean, maybe I add on to, maybe I can add to, as a footnote to uh, Nira's uh, point that the, you know, the picture that you present suggests that there's a that the hegemonic narrative has a certain unity and a certain sort of universe, not universality, but perhaps universalizability. Uh, whereas the counter-hegemonic narrative is almost definitionally fragmented. Uh, and so you know, uh, the, the hegemonic narrative, which is the dominant narrative, has the possibility of being universalized, and uh, its justifications are universalized too. But the counter hegemonic narrative becomes incredibly fragmented. Uh, you know, how does one sort of deal with that? That's what for both of you question. Please. Well, thank you very much for the question. <coughs> well, in fact, they are the same question. In a sense, your question is very well that the nearest question is also now. Uh, well, if, if you got the idea that I have uh, a romantic view of this, is the wrong idea, but well, I didn't express myself clearly now. I'm trying to analyze it, not out of a typical Marxist hermeneutics of suspicion, because from the base, on the basis of my training, I use this business immediately. <coughs> no value. It will be absolutely cynical. But we have been wrong for so long, so many times, that now I think we better pay attention to what's going on and not dismissing the concepts that we have been using in the past. So I think that probably I'm in a position that at this moment we need some unlearning of our theories in order to relearn uh, something from what's coming out from these movements and these processes. And I think that we have identified clearly uh, one of the first ambiguities, the fact that in some, sometimes <coughs> these protests uh, they have some strong similarities with the extreme right contexts in protests. Not so much the extreme right that is rising in Europe, is not the, because the extreme right that is rising in Europe are parties and they are using party politics and media. 
and they take different forms. And, uh, but uh, in the, the rightist, extreme right movements in, in the United States, and I've studied them uh, a little bit enough to understand the differences, you can see also sometimes the result to a kind of a strict reading of the Constitution, which is very similar to a strict reading of the Sharia, or some Islamic extremists. So they are, in fact, very fundamentalist in this respect. And sometimes it's difficult to distinguish uh, right-wing populism from left-wing populism, if you like. Even populism is a bad word for all the critical theories. We never like populism, except in a very specific context. Right? So, I think that the conditions of our time and this, uh, uh, the ambiguity is constitutive of it. Because I think the ambiguity is inside us. The problem is that. I think we may be, you know, that's why probably the distinction, that's why I disagree with my friend Monroe Castell. I mean, we are beyond the distinction between consumption and production because consumption is producing ourselves. When you are in university, it requires, as Patricia was telling me, that you use a good PowerPoint in order to get a promotion or get admission, you know, a technology, a technological fit. It has nothing to do with your merit, with your knowledge, but, you know, the mastering a technique, a PowerPoint. Look, the extent to which they are normalizing your mind. And that's why sometimes whenever I go, they ask me the first question is whether I use a PowerPoint or not. Because in, in a, a couple of years, it will be a very odd thing not to use a, a PowerPoint. So, concerning Nira, I start from saying that there are not movements. I stated that there are some collective presences. Right? I didn't say that we left. I, I never used this expression except when I said comparing with left tradition. Because many of them, as the uh, Anazar movement and now the Up movement, they refuse to put themselves in this divide, left and right. Is this good or bad? From my training, from a Marxist critical tradition, this is extremely wrong. Because that's the neoliberalism, what they want is that since there is no alternative, this distinction doesn't make any sense anymore. We have to claim this distinction problem. But this is just the beginning of the story. Because the current distinction as it exists has very little value. So we have to reinvent the left. And the where it stays that we have not yet done that. And I don't even know whether it was well we pick to do that at this point. We are too afraid of losing the old ground and to try a new ground because it's a risk that is in a sense uninsurable. We really don't know how these movements are leading. And I would agree with Nira completely almost on everything except some, uh, uh, some criticisms of the, the World Social Forum. I know where they come from. But the World Social Forum is a very complex entity. Of course, there are very well-funded NGOs <coughs> that they try to go to movements. And that's why today we have the World Social Forum and the Assembly of the Social Movements, <coughs> two separate institutions. And precisely to make the distinction to isolate the World Social Forum and the, the, the Assembly of Social Movements. And those, in a sense, try to keep the uh, genuine type of counter-hegemonic globalization away from Oxfam or Amnesty International or whatever other great institution, or Action Aid or, or Caritas or, or, or others. Of course, they fund lots of actions, but people are not naive that they don't understand that there are strategies, global strategies, that are, of course, there. So the counter-hegemonic globalization is today much more ambiguous than before. Why is that? Well, because in 2001, uh, I was part of the dialogue between the economic, World Economic Forum in Davos and the one in Porto Alegre. At that time, I remember on one side was George Soros, on this side was Whitaker and other people from the Social Forum. Well, the, the, the World Economic Forum goes on meeting every year and World Social Forum is not there anymore. So we, can, we have to live up with, with these weaknesses because we have seen the weaknesses of many organizational processes, political parties on the left, the communist party, the socialist parties. 
and we have seen how the crisis is within us. I think that our time is either too late to be born revolutionary or too premature to be clear revolutionary. And this is, if we don't work with the spirit of it this time, I mean, these movements, these protests, these presences, they at least should create perplexity. Call them middle classes. Well, it's easy. Middle classes is from the beginning of this qualified movement from our Marxist tradition. Because middle classes, in fact, what they want is the establishment and the state. And they go home as soon as possible. And you can see that. Of course, the Indianapolis movement, in fact, have lots of people from the middle class. The problem is that the concept of middle class is going away. What we see throughout the world is the shrinking of all these middle class, the impoverishment, what is called the abrupt impoverishment of families today. The precariousness, right with uh, work without rights. Probably these ideas of the middle class were part of a kind of a historical compromise between capitalist democracy and capitalism <coughs> of the Second World War during the Cold War. There was a delusion for us to think that in 1989, socialism came to an end. What came to an end, of course, was socialism, but together with it, social democracy and reformism. That's why from then on, we have an attack on public rights, on, so on social rights, on social policies. From then on, we knew that revolution and reform were twins, but we on the left fought as they were the enemies. But the, world, the, the fall of the Berlin Wall came to the <coughs> they were together. The revolution is gone, and the same day, the reformism is gone. And that's why, at the end of the 20th century, beginning of the 21st century, we have the most anti-social form of capitalism. Look at us, the housing question. Look at today. Charles Dickens comes to be current affairs in many countries. All the people sleep on the streets here, and they have to pay a rent to spill out to sleep on the streets. What kind of regulation is this? What kind of regulation <coughs> is this? It's not that they sleep on the streets, it's they pay rent for that. And discriminate, the rent is different according to the quality of the streets. <coughs> what world are we in? That's the perplexity. And I think that these people, that they're not inherit our theories. They are away from our theories and they have been discontent and sometimes for good reasons. When much of the left politics that put names on it, they refuse to be classified on left and right. And of course, rightist forces are going to try to benefit from that. I've seen that all the time. A good experience for my own work is what happened to participatory democracy. You have because it's available in English, my study on the participatory <coughs> democracy in Porto Alegre in Brazil. It was a surprise to all of us, ten years later, when the World Bank called the mayor of Porto Alegre, who is now the governor, Tasso Gero, to come to Washington to explain to World Bank CEOs what was this nice thing <coughs> participatory democracy. Because it looked like a good instrument against corruption. And the World Bank adopted the idea of participatory democracy. Were they interested in the empowerment of people, <coughs> participatory democracy? No. They were interested, interested in the technocracy of participatory democracy, the fight against corruption. And you have today text by the documents by the World Bank that, of course, can we abandon participatory democracy because the World Bank has adopted it? We had a very interesting meeting in Brazil before the mayor went to Washington. Our advice to him was to radicalize the proposal so much that the World Bank cannot take it. So it's very much important, the participatory element, then the money that goes into this, uh, these localities. That the question is not corruption, it's a change in the political system so that people can be, in fact, more uh, closer, what is closer to representatives, through a combination of representative democracy with participatory democracy. That has been the, the struggle. So I think that uh, 
They may be dangerous. Nobody knows. I mean, they are very weak. I mean, nobody remembers the Occupy today. Are they going to reemerge? Look at the, and in favor of your argument there, look what happened to the student movement in Chile. Very radical. Very radical, very interesting. <coughs> One of the leader was uh, the, the daughter of a great communist leader in, in Chile. Well, she is now a member of the party, a member of the Socialist Party. to say, the student movement was co-opted. They decided their best way to continue to fight was to join representative democracy, not creating a party, as they did in, uh, here in India, but joining an existing party, the Socialist Party. The Socialist Party, Michel Bachelet, has now a couple of student uh, uh, leaders as deputies in the parliament. And in fact, they came not individually, they came with an agenda. They said, we join our part, party if you take into your program public education and the constitutional reform. Michel promised that she would do that. The skeptical say that she will not keep up with the promise, but we don't know. I think that uh, most probably these things dissipate. My, and, and my feeling is this, these presence, collective presences, they are not truthful because they are the solution. They are truthful because they call for the need for a solution. So they may be failing, but this is a kind of an epochal time. <coughs> they will fail and fail again, probably, but there is a time in which it looks like they, there is a truthful call for something else. And he's taking some forms. And in some countries, what is interesting for me is that up in this country takes the form of being above left and right, precisely like the Cinquish Tele in, it, in Italy, the Five Stars Movement. That now is a party launched by a clown, Pepe Grillo. 16% of the vote, national vote in Italy. Deciding now much of the politics. We had a fierce debate in Spain between the indignados and the representatives of the Simply Step, the Five Stars Party. Because for the indignados movement, it's unthinkable to think of resistance without the left-right distinction. We have to say which side are you on. And for us, it's clear. I'm on the side of the oppressed, of the oppressors. It's so confused. The deputy of the Simply Step said, no, we don't do that this way. We go by Issues. For instance, we are in favor of the legalization of abortion. If the people come to us and accept this idea, be they from the right and from the left, we don't care. We are in two based, nothing else. I've seen that here. Now the problem is that we keep asking her, but legalization of abortion, this is a left demand. It has been a left demand historically for a long time. Well, you don't care. That's our thing. You see, coincidence with some of the leftist agenda, but refuses to call it itself leftist. Why it is so easy for these movements to discard the identity of the left? I think this forces us to think about our historical phases. And if we don't use this opportunity to do so, then I become skeptical. But up until now, I, I'm not completely, because I think that there is this room from resistance. And I think that, to finalize this point, is that, the most, the, the, for me, the most troubling uh, point is not that some people take to the streets and <coughs> others not. Because I know that those that don't take the streets, they control the law. They die but behind the 1% law. You know, for, for instance, our Bill Boyers, I don't know if a famous journalist in the United States, Exposed the Alec, <coughs> American Legal Exchange Council, is a huge concern of large corporations that are producing draft laws against public health, against public education, against everything that is leftist or central in the United States. Left is very complicated, but is they are promoting the representatives in all the states that promote those laws. So ready-made legality, right? This legality that is presented to the different. It has been exposed. Go to ALEC and you'll see uh, this denunciation. 
Why these people on the streets, they don't have this privilege, okay? The problem is that on the streets you don't do political formulation. You produce alternatives when you are on the street. So you have to go home, to some place, and read some institutionality. Well, some as the apple decide to become a party. Others refuse to be a party. How can we do that? So I think it's, uh, there are no clear-cut answers. So ambiguity is part of the risk that we are running. Um, I think that um, I don't think that uh, I think that you are right. The hegemonic narrative is hegemonic because it managed to be universalized. That's why it became hegemony in the Gramscian sense. It's so hegemonic that the people that are wounded and uh, and oppressed by these uh, principles adopt them. They think they are the best. There are more people that think today that the state, in fact, should not be so much involved in our lives in public health or education. The people that depend most on the state are now against the state. So that is hegemony, very clearly. And the counter narrative is fragmented. Definitely. I work, for instance, in Latin America with indigenous peoples. If you work with them with a socialist agenda, the first thing that they tell you is that socialism is a white trap, like any other trap. Why is that? Because the communist parties and the socialist parties in Latin America were racists all the time. Workers would bring about revolution. Indigenous people, a residue of history, they are condemned by history. They are not useful. How can an indigenous people think now, because they identify Marxism with socialism, there are other currents of socialism, but they say, now, our way cannot even be expressed in colonial language. <coughs> Summa causa. So the concept that is enshrined in the Equatorian Constitution is that our model is summa causa. What is summa causa? Good living. In, in Quechua, in, a, in Spanish, it's buen vivir. Good living in English. But this concept in Quechua has a spiritual dimension, not religious, a spiritual dimension that escapes us. It includes the cult of the ancestors, the presence of the different ancestors in our lives. We cannot understand that. Because from the Western point of view, either you are dead or alive. If you are an ancestor, you are dead or alive. <laughs> How can you be side by side? And I've been in meetings in which the Titus, the indigenous chiefs, say the ancestors are here on our day. How are they here if we don't see them? Yes, we know they are here. It's another cosmovision. Am I going to dismiss them because they don't use socialism? So really, my question is, is for this uh, Universalization from below, that is to say, intercultural translation to try and my project to, to bring the global south together. We're talking at lunchtime how we can meet the, the, this network, the Latinx, with the, the Latin American network, very similar against the Lawman Society as a kind of an anti imperial Lawman Society movement. We are going to do it. And my colleague from Mozambique down there, she's involved in legal pluralism in Africa and in Mozambique. We are trying to put it together. But we have to start from the present that, in fact, we are fragmented. We don't talk to each other. Remember that in, if I want to go to the United States, is one thing and costs a couple of, of you know, some, uh, some dollars, of course, this trip, transcontinental trip. But to bring someone from Peru or from Colombia to Brazil is probably more expensive than to take it from Lisbon or from Madrid to the United States. Globalization, neoliberal is very good at being north and south and north and north. But south south is almost impossible. In Tunisia, we couldn't have many movements because they didn't get visa. Islamic movements these days, they don't get visa anywhere. We are organizing, I don't know where the, the fault comes from, but in this uh, popular universe of social movement that we are organizing in Mumbai, we wanted to have. Pakistan movements. We couldn't get them because the visa would take an eternity. So, having to. Okay, I'm sorry. Well, I'm sorry. Uh, so, 
this, there are so many things that you touched upon, uh, but I was wondering uh, if you can comment on this. Uh, one of the things, one of the most peculiar things about the movement, at least in India, was the way the visual aspect of the movement was played out, uh, especially with the formation of the of the of the Aam Aadmi Party, right? So there was a lot of symbolic presence to it. Uh, when you were talking about democracy and uh, representation, I was wondering also how these symbolic visual ideas of movement was was transmitted amongst amongst I mean how the politi political socialization took place and. In that sense, the internet was a very big, powerful tool. So the contours of democracy, of participatory democracy, completely changed in that sense, where this, you could um, adapt to a symbol in your, on your networking page, and you were part of the movement. So your presence really was never required. And I think, uh, in that sense, when, when, we, when we think of democracy now, today, when we when we try and understand democracy in the context of what is happening in India, uh, in Delhi especially, uh, I was wondering if it is if the potential of real democracy is lost in its in the visual articulation itself. Where right? my participation is really in holding the broom or wearing the cap, and not so much as being a political agent. So, and I think you flagged it off when you said about the threshold of um, political socialization being low. I mean, where you're talking about who participate. So, uh, yeah, I mean, so it was just it was just a philosophy that I have, and I would like to pose it to you. It's very good, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Did what? Not stopping because I'm done right. <laughs> <laughs> I um, I think we are right. The the problem the ways of agency and the process of agency um, are also changing. And the social networks are really changing with the concepts of political agency. Sometimes I'm a bit skeptical about this. Uh, because I've seen, if we look at this 1848, how is it possible without the internet? A movement that started in, in Paris, next week was in Germany. In the central Europe, we have these reports. No network, no social network. So there are other ways of creating temptation in the middle of the 18th century. The Russians, as they were called, and they were very well organized by, by Marx. Now, I think that uh, it is true that the social networks are, are changing the terms, and of course are changing the symbols, and are changing the identities. There was a time in which the discussion on these topics before the social networks was called e-democracy, electronic democracy. Well, and we were, many of us were against electronic democracy for a very simple reason, is that the electronic democracy does not overcome the idea of the individual. So that is to say, it's liberal democracy. Because I'm at home with my computer, and I'm voting on issues, but I'm not discussing with anyone I vote. And the debate was always that e-democracy, electronic democracy, could be used if complemented with collective moments in which you build a public opinion before you decide. Otherwise, it would be a trap, a liberal trap. With the networks, now it's different because you create a collective opinion almost instantaneously with Facebook, with Twitter. So there is a different dimension. We are going over the idea of the collective individual through this process. But there is a but in here. If the collective action involves risks, I don't think that we can dispense with presential moments, presences. My experience tells me that the different movements, when they get together, we have managed to bring together in, in collective actions, LGBT with peasants, with indigenous movement, with the tribal people, and so on. But that may be today continued by the internet, but there is a moment in which we are face to face, in which we look at the faces, we touch people, we eat together, we drink together, we look at the drinks, 
and the smiles of the people and gestures. Things that escape the social network. So I think that symbolic visuality is changing <coughs> massively with social networks. But I'm not thinking the presence is going to be uh, eliminated, on the contrary. And I think that physical presence is the only thing that is more difficult to control for the increasingly authoritarian powers that are in the country. They have to criminalize your body. They have to bring suffering upon your body. With the internet, they shut it down, and they have been doing it all the time. And they are prepared to do that in the future whenever more dangerous actions <coughs> are considered. Suppose that the Occupy, instead of occupying the streets, were occupying the banks. Do you think that the networks will be working? The, the cell phones will be disconnected immediately. So I think that we, we shouldn't be too enthusiastic. I mean, they are very important. I'm not saying that they are not important. And they change the symbolics of things. But the risks need a new corporeality. The bodies of the people. Collectively, but they are individual bodies because only the individual bodies really get physical suffering. And the physical suffering has to be either accepted or resisted against. And that's why I think that martyrdom in the Islamic today is something that we call suicide bombers is so difficult for us to analyze, even though people in the Christian tradition should have no difficult because the first Christians were all of them suicide bombers in the sense, martyrs, because they, they did the thing just to be killed. Uh, but we have forgotten that history, so we call them now suicide bombers. But, you know, that's this presence. Always bring into the picture. There's a question here. Yeah, I just had a remark. So, I mean, going through the 80s and 90s, where, where, where one associates the terminology of negatives with movements, for example, we say striking, striking work, which is which is essentially collective absence against collective presence. Yeah. And then we had civil disobedience movement and then we call them resistance movements. All, all we use, I mean, for all, all of these we use passive and negative terminology, but whereas for the, for the newer movements, we seem to start, we seem to, we seem to have started using certain positive terminology, even for example, occupy, where there is certain active element in it and then we have collective presence, again, there is, there is some, so where did this shift happen, sir? So mm -hmm. is, is it something that uh, you've noted or something that you've been commenting? Well, in, in, in my work is interesting because of on part of the, the, the paper, the article that Professor was uh, mentioning in the introduction is about sociology of absences and uh, sociology of emergencies. Uh, the idea that as I said, for it's disorganized people, most people don't belong to parties or social movements. And in a sense, they were not dealt with by social theory, even though they are the majority of the people. So they are very absent. Now they make themselves present in a very ambiguous way. And it's very difficult to understand these presences. They are emerging, and we don't know the direction. It could be a new form of barbarism. Depends on us. I mean, either you join and try to influence the struggle, but if we stay outside, of course, there are people that are interested in these struggles, and they will try to co-opt them. But I think still the negative element is still very strong. Uh, I agree with you. There are ideas that the presence, the concept of occupy, is, is very strong, but didn't catch up very much. The concept of indignation got that much more strong. That is to say, the ethical impulse of considering that a market economy may be okay, but the, a, a market society is morally repugnant. If everything is for sale, even your political beliefs, your votes, your representatives, and so on, this is morally repugnant. For these people, I mean, the idea so is an ethical there. But I agree that may take other forms. For instance, the landless movement, the Occupy, was invented, was not invented here. The concept of occupation comes from landless movement in modern times. And why is it? Is a name, a positive name, against an, uh, a negative name? Once the landless movement throughout Latin America occupied land, 
it was considered invasion, illegal invasion. So, and the newspaper would say, landless peasants invaded this property, and so on, invasion. And they start a struggle for renaming the story. This is not invasion, this is occupation. And the indigenous people, uh, the people also changed this renaming thing in order to improve uh, their, their struggle. So that they don't ask for agrarian reform because they said, we are, we are here before the colonialists. We want the evolution of our land. So it is a different language that calls for different positive aims. In some moments they are very clear. But in others, the idea of the rejections of the status quo is very strong. Radical in discourse, the practice, what do these kids do when they go home? They would go to the laptops if they are middle class, many of them are. <coughs> or if these people are going to work overnight because these kids work today in call centers even though they have PhDs. <coughs> and they make a, a minimum salary in many countries, in the United States today. And they have no rights. So, and that's why I think that the dream of, or well, there are many studies about the end of the middle class in the United States, and that's why the universities in the United States are in such a crisis, because the middle class in the United States was created by the public universities, and now they are very expensive. And only the Ivy League is becoming global universities. The elites don't go to the public schools, they go to the global universities. So I don't know, I think that you are right. Probably there are more positive things, and it's very interesting. Well, I'm not in this country analyzing, other people are analyzing this current movement, the movement starts as a kind, of, uh, use a kind of a negative concept, anti-corruption. But can we change a system by just eliminating corruption? There must be something else other, other than strike against corruption. What is that? Positivity. As a movement, you don't have to define it. As a party, probably you have to. That's probably what APIs are struggling about. They don't know what to do with it, probably. Very much, Professor Santos. I think a couple of concluding comments. Or you have a question? Yeah. Uh, can we take one? Can we take one more question? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. So, so in that order. Yeah. 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 In initial Primal Act, means uh, 42, uh, I mean, Primal, uh, imagine <coughs> in Primal, socialism is included in, uh, yeah, I think, 1970. But after uh, 1991, without changing the system, liberalization policy, they, the whole system is going to the, through the capitalism, without the uh, social security. And uh, I, what I have perceived that uh, capitalism, without changing the terminology, like in favor of 1%, which is said that 1% versus 99%. Mm -hmm. So without change of the country, means uh, without change of the country, can it be possible to change part in 99%? Mm -hmm. There's one more Thank you so much for the an amazing presentation. And I um, almost completely agree with your analysis of these movements. Thank you for the lovely face, collective presences, uh, and for the need to step out of a certain arid uh, restatement of theory that has clearly, uh, in a new century, needs to be rethought. And I, I, I'm completely in agreement with your analysis and with your responses. Um, so I had uh, two, uh, one, Question that I come to at the end and one comment. And the comment actually arose from your response to the earlier question about positivity that uh, you know anti-corruption cannot be a positive program. And I think just I just want to flag here, although that is not the, you know, the substance of your talk, I do want to flag here that uh, anti-corruption was always about as far as I mean any analysis of our parties politics and the movement that preceded it 
I would say that uh, corruption was a, actually a very substantial term, which uh, reflects uh, a certain kind of politics that does not call itself anti-capitalist, does not call itself left, does not call itself <coughs> any of those things, but in its actions, the activity against corruption has been resolutely anti-corporate. At least that, it has been anti-corporation. And uh, which no party in India has actually been able to do, including the Communist Party. Um, so uh, I think it is a certain kind of a misleading representation that comes out of that same arid Marx theory, uh, which is unable to understand what's going on. So anti-corruption is actually uh, it's actually a positivity. It seems to me. My question to you is that if I understand. <laughs> Uh, at the end of your talk, it, the answer to the question, is it possible to occupy the law? I understand your answer to be, and please correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, um, that you thought that it was possible to occupy the law uh, through court and hegemonic practices, provided that the previous politicization had been done, but that now you believe it is no longer possible uh, and it seems to me that you were saying it is no longer possible because the politicization project is uh, somehow sort of fraught at the start. Um, it seems to me that I would, I would argue that uh, it is, and this is an argument that precedes these movements, this is an argument that you know, at least some of us would have made, and I have certainly made, that it is in fact impossible to occupy the law because the law in, at some level or the other is configurative in your terms. That it is not nothing but configurative and so subversive politics would always have to be counter to the law. So um, I would answer your question, is it possible, possible to occupy the law in that way? But I understood your answer to be slightly different and I would like you to reflect a little bit more. <coughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, your, your question is, uh, is a very interesting question because um, on one side, we are at the moment, particularly after these uh, uh, protests and so on, they claim that these uh, new constitutions, this new constituent power, which in fact was an expression that came from the old Marxism of the 60s that some of us has expounded like uh, Anthony Neville. Of the masses. Um, it is true that after all, all these changes and many changes in different countries were under the radar of the constitutions. The constitution didn't change. Some constitutions still claim that we are heading into socialism, when every day we are heading into more anti social capitalism. So, and this has discredited. Uh, constitutionalism in many voices, for instance, on the left, on the movements, and so on. Why today this constitutional appeal uh, is coming again? I see two reasons. One is that the deconstitutionalization, as we call it, that is the ordinary laws and judiciary sometimes deconstruct, destroy the constitutions almost every day. I could give you examples from the most positive, advanced, uh, progressive constitution, 2008 in Ecuador and 2009 in Bolivia, how the ordinary legislation is destroying the constitutional impulse. For example, uh, the role of indigenous justice, we are in, in a center for white governance. So the indigenous justice, for instance, legal pluralism was very strong in the constitution. If you look at the ordinary law that regulates that, the indigenous legislation, is a very small role to play. So the Constitution is being destroyed. So in, and it's so blatant, so blatantly, that people are appealing to the Constitution as a positive idea. But how, as our colleague mentioned before, the appeal to the Constitution may also be a bit progressive. So that's the ambiguity of the struggles. It is really, we want to bring a kind of a globalization from below, but we have to account for these differences. Because one size does not fit all. 
There are countries in which I don't be in favor, in favor of, go, of going through the law to bring about social transformation because the law is so repressive. The judicial system is so corrupt. That doesn't make any sense. And I learned that very early on when Allende was power in, in, in Chile. Salvador Allende was a, a short uh, 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 run socialist government, democratic socialist government in, in Chile. The, the Pinochet changed the law so much that the law was so hostile to the lower classes, to the workers, to the peasants, that it wouldn't make any sense to struggle through the law. The struggle had to be completely outside the law. So if we were in a dictatorial system, they reduce the contradictory aspects of the law, the legal system and the constitutions. There are, in other contexts, we can play with constitutions and with contradictions. Well, in our case today, I think that probably capital is going to follow in this entire social drive that people are again thinking that the only way of changing the whole thing is a new system, political system. And our political imagination is incapable of thinking of a new political system without a new constitution. So even if you fight against the Western modernity models, use a Western model, modern model to fight against the model of a paper, of a constitution, that in a sense people get disempowered the moment that the constitution is promulgated. That's in our discussions in Ecuador and Bolivia we say the struggle for the Constitution starts the first day after the promulgation. It's very easy until you promulgate the Constitution. It's very difficult after the promulgation because then the struggle is serious. <coughs> so I think that now we have this double situation, an exceptional uh, a state of emergency that I can see through the crisis in many countries that goes under constitutional normals, no state of emergency. On the other side, I see an appeal to constitutionalism from below. That's what we call transformative constitutionalism. That would be my, my answer. Well, your question, thank you for the comments, and very briefly on your question. Uh, <clears throat> well, I don't say that it's no longer possible. Well, I, what I'm saying is much more difficult. I mean, I still, precise of this appeal to transformative constitutionalism, I think I think that it is impossible to keep anti-systemic energies in a time in which we lack the paradigm of the global social revolution in the public agenda. That we cannot, without becoming cynical or, or give up the struggle, use whatever means there are. So what I'm saying is that I'm desperate. A sense. The theory is a, a kind of a sense of desperation. That is to say, there is still this appeal to new constitutionalism through a change in the system. That's where I see the genuine element for the counter hegemonic use of the law. I think that if we don't change the political system, we very, you know, improbably will change something substantial. But my experience is that. Social movements, political organizations, in every epoch, we fight with weapons that are available. And uh, we don't choose the weapons. They are the ones that are there. And we use them as best as we can. And I think that this, by appealing to a new constitution, could be a sham, could be another frustration I had. In a sense, the case of Tunisia is a tragic lesson on this. So much hope. And I was there for World Social Forum. So much hope for the Constitution, and the, the political system cannot deliver a Constitution. So, if the Constitution is failed, the change in the political system, where are we? I better not answer because I don't know what to answer. Thank you very much. I mean, if the liberty is just spending a couple of moments to sum up, I, your last statement is, um, is very thought provoking. How much? How much can change in a political system actually uh, bring about a substantial transformation uh, given the nature of capital in the 21st century, given the, uh, the deepening of inequality 
across the world, and I gather we are all reading for this book called Capital in the 21st Century by Thomas Piketty. So, you know, one needs to uh, one needs to see whether a change in political systems can actually bring about a fundamental transformation or not. Uh, but you know, apropos the point made by this young man and by Nivedita about uh, about anti this and anti that. There's also a tendency, uh, including in India, to use post as a prefix rather than anti. So uh, you have anti-corruption, but then you have, you know, is this post identity? Is this post ideology? And you use the term post institutional, which is very interesting because, uh, because again, uh, different countries, in different countries, the very movements you mentioned have had different sorts of institutional aspirations. So the, uh, you know, what the Arab Spring, what, what Egypt wanted, uh, the protesters in Egypt wanted precisely the sorts of institutions that the Occupy people were rejecting, right? So, uh, so one country's uh, meat was another country's poison when it came to institutions, right? So uh, I don't know whether this post and anti vocabulary does anything. I think we're searching for a new vocabulary. It seems to me, and so we don't actually have it. And in that, the biggest shibboleth perhaps is democracy. We keep qualifying it, real democracy, deep democracy, direct democracy, participatory democracy, but there is a deep dissatisfaction there, and I think we're unable, in our current vocabularies, unable to capture, uh, uh, capture it in a positive, in a positive frame. But, um, but despite being post-ideological, sometimes anti-politics, our own up, uh, uh, does have a sort of a, you know, a, that as well as the a movement against uh, sexual violence that took place uh, about a year and a half ago, actually a year ago. Both have prefigurative elements mm -hmm. because they do engage with the law, they do seek legal change, not a change in the larger framework of the law, but incremental change in particular laws. So they do engage with the law in ways that perhaps some of the social movements you mentioned uh, do not. But I think we've left with a lot of uh, provocations, a lot of insights, a lot to think about. Thank you very much. You're all invited for tea downstairs. Thank you.